And welcome everybody. Let me go ahead and uh, dial in my screens here. <clears throat> hey, it is great to have you. Thank you for joining me for uh, CCNA Sunday, all things CCNA. And our objectives, what we're going to do is I've laid out a an outline for the next probably couple, three months of topics I'd like to cover from CCNA, Cisco Certified Network Associate. And I'm going to cherry pick a little bit and kind of create the content that I wish that someone had created for me uh, almost two and a half decades ago as I began to learn Cisco and started to get involved with it. So um, our objectives are these right here. Pretty straightforward. Let me go ahead and hide this one layer as I talk through this with you. Um, our objectives are for us at the end of our short time together today. I would love us, either one of us, both of us, to be able to describe what is a client or a server. If somebody, so if somebody says that, we can say, oh, I know exactly what that means and how that fits. What is the benefit of a layer or what even is a layer? And then what is a protocol stack? So that's our objectives. We'll come back at the end of the stream and we'll confirm that we are all comfortable with those topics. And we're just going to build one logical piece at a time. All right, so let's go to this network and let me bring out uh, a little pen so I can annotate some of this. And let me bring that up. There it is. And this is a pen that allows me to write on the top of everything, which is just absolutely wonderful. All right. So let's start off with the concept of, and it's, this is a lot like just going into a restaurant. Let's talk about that for just a moment regarding servers and clients. If, if you and I have a full-time job, one of my first jobs back in the, uh, I guess it was the uh, late seventies. <laughs> one of my first jobs was a, uh, I would collect dishes, a busboy at a restaurant in Camarillo, California, and I would collect the dishes and bring them back. And then I, I upgraded. I got a better job as a waiter. Uh, I couldn't serve alcohol because I wasn't old enough. But as I did get older, um, I was a waiter. And so if you and I went into a restaurant and someone comes to take our order, they're providing us a service. So in that context, us or the client, we as a client would be the customer and the server would be providing service. Now behind that, wait staff there's also people who are preparing the food and doing a whole bunch of other things to deliver that food to us so in a computer network anytime we think of the concept of a server it's some device that's providing a network function or service let's take a closer look at our diagram and make sure we're both clear on that idea so let's take this server right here so when we say a public facing server it that implies that we have a server that is reachable by the public. So in this case, reachable by people on the internet. So as far as what kind of service could a server provide, let's talk, let's talk about some common ones. Uh, for example, web services. I mean, just think about the last time you went to a website. Uh, like, well, we mean like Keith, like two seconds ago when I got on the stream or watching this video. Yes, that's a great example. Or we might have some type of file services that we're getting on online, or we could have some kind of a streaming service that we're getting, or we could have some kind of a authentication service. So basically a server is providing some functionality, some service that we're consuming. And so file services and web services are great ways to think about that to kind of keep them um, straight. Like, so any device on the network that's providing a service, providing information, providing a function is, can be considered in that moment a server. So if we have one of these devices, and let's say it's a web server, that in that moment is acting as a server. So let's take a look next at clients. So clients would be somebody who's requesting the services. And that's it. So if we look at our topology again, a client could be like this guy right here. Now in my, <laughs> in my con, I'm gonna let you know a little secret. In my, when I discuss uh, networks and talk about users, I usually use one of two users. I use Bob or Lois, and I'm going to reveal why that is. Uh, my father, who is 90 years old, his name is Bob, and his last name is Barker, so that's kind of funny. Anyway, it's not the same Bob Barker. But, um, and my mom's name is Lois, and so that's why I use Bob and Lois as individuals, as examples of users on the network. So what it helps me to do is when I'm talking about or we're learning about concepts, I like to involve and visualize or imagine the actual user who's using the network, because that kind of gives a better or bigger picture of how it's functioning. So if we go back to our topology here, we have Bob who's sitting at this computer and Bob opens up a browser. So a browser, there's lots of browsers out there, web browsers, um, things like Chrome, 
things like Internet Explorer and now Edge and Firefox and um, Safari and other third-party browsers. But those browsers are programs that are running on the computer that are acting as and can use the protocols or to use services from network devices. So that allows Bob as a client and his software running as a client to reach out and connect to a server and get those services. So boom, that's on our checklist. What is a client or a server? A server is providing some type of a network service and a client is consuming or asking or requesting for that, that service. Now, I do have another question for you and, and that's this. Let me clear off my screen. What if at one moment we have a device that's making a request, it's going out to the internet asking for information and then a moment later, it's actually providing a service to another client. So maybe it's a device here. Let's go ahead and pick uh, this device. So this is a teeny little Raspberry Pi that has lots of capabilities. But anyway, let's imagine this is a device and at one moment it is providing a network service. Maybe somebody's connecting to it over the network and requesting web pages. And at the same time, this is reaching out to another device and requesting time services to find out what the accurate time is. Well, in that moment, this device is acting both as a client and a server. It's acting as a client, asking for the time. It's also asking, uh, acting as a server when it's providing web services. So when we talk about clients and servers, it really depends on the exact, um, you know, the exact moment or what the function is at that moment. And lots of devices, in fact, most devices on networks are acting as some type of a client for something and also as a server, if it's like a, a web server or file server and so forth. And that includes streaming. So if you're a Fortnite fan, there are servers out there providing those services and your client, your PCs are acting as clients requesting and consuming those services as you interact and crush the game. All right, I like Fortnite. I'm not good at Fortnite, <laughs> but it's amazing. And also, check this out. Uh, I, have a, I have some family members who are really into gaming. And whenever the network isn't working correctly or they feel like, hey, this isn't working right, I'll tell you one of the major benefits of really understanding how the pieces all fit together. And that is when something goes wrong, you can check your piece of it, your part of it. You say, well, here's the four steps I'm responsible for my computer as a client on this network. Let me check those four things out and verify there's not a problem locally. And then if it's on the internet or at the remote servers, there's not as much we can do. But the cool thing is you can check locally once we understand the pieces. And that's the, the benefit of the second part here that I'd like to talk about. And that is the, uh, the benefits of layers. And let me go ahead and bring the screen back up. So layers are amazing. And you might think, well, Keith, what do you mean like layers? Like if it gets cold, we should have layers so that we can you know, keep warm or keep cool. Um, yeah, there's layers in that sense as well, but there's also the concept of individual components or pieces that can all work together that we don't have to understand all of it at once. A great analogy is sort of like, let's imagine, um, let me tell you, what day is it? Sunday. Um, Thursday, uh, my wife and I flew out to San Francisco for a couple days, see some friends, see a Cirque du Soleil show that was there, Anna Luna, it was really fun. And we also got to go see a movie. And this movie was actually a movie on the big screen at the Symphony Hall in San Francisco. <laughs> if you ever have a chance to do this, it's so fun. It was breathtaking. I was just like, I had never experienced anything like that before. So let's consider a theater, whether it's the Symphony Hall or a movie theater. You know, there's a lot going on to make that all happen. Uh, there's concessions, you know, or they're selling uh, food or, or snacks and things like that. <laughs> Um, there's ticket sales. They've got to get the movie dialed in. So they have to order that or get this, um, the agreement for that. Uh, what else? Um, they have to have ushers. They have to have people who help them to their seats. Uh, they have to have uh, fire prevention in the building and probably exit signs. And there's just a ton of stuff that goes into a production like that. So if it's a movie theater or if it's a symphony, there's just so much going on. It wouldn't make sense for us to go in and say, yeah, we're going to go ahead and define all this, boom, there it is. Everything, every aspect of it. It would make sense for us to take individual parts of that and break it out and then better understand those parts and how those parts all work together. That, my friend, is the benefit of having layers inside of our computer networks. That way we can say, oh, this is a layer three deal function. And then we can focus just on that. So the objective here is to see the benefit of layers and the benefit of layers is that we can take each individual component on its own and then focus on that part of the network functionality and how it works to really better understand it.
So that's that's objective number two. Understand the benefit of layers. Now, now that I've said that, let me show you some layers. And a long, long time ago, in a galaxy far away, I learned Novell. And you're thinking, what the? What, what's Novell? <laughs> that's a good question if you're under 40. Um, Novell back in the, I guess it was late 70s, early 80s, was the network operating system on the street. And this is before computers had TCPIP as a protocol that came native with them. Anyway, um, so back in the early days, I was taught in my early days of networking to learn what are referred to as the OSI reference model, which is this bad boy right, right here. Let me get out the appropriate tool here. In fact, let me bring this up. So this OSI reference model, it was, it's a model. It's not like nobody really uses it. It's just an idea of chunking up or sectioning out functionality in the network. Like, like that, going to a, a movie theater and then breaking out, okay, here's how the concessions work or breaking out, okay, here's how ticket sales work or here's how the, uh, the, um, the seating arrangement works and here's how the air conditioning works and so forth. Instead of treating it all like one giant lump, we have layers of functionality. And this OSI reference model had seven layers. And if this was 20 years ago, <laughs> I'd have you memorize those. <laughs> Newsflash, it's not 20 years ago. But in the original OSI reference model, which is still around as an idea or framework, uh, there are seven layers. And so in the old days, we'd memorize those. Okay, I'm gonna memorize all seven. And we had mnemonics for memorizing those. It was real party. Um, today, we don't use the OSI reference model literally, but we do use something else. We use something called the TCP IP. Wow, that's a, a mouthful of letters. Uh, TCP IP protocol suite. And let's take a look. Well, let's talk about the word protocol first. Um, my goal for us, you and I, is to see every component that we're every every aspect that matters for computer networking, and make sure that you and I get it, that we understand it, that there's not like, oh, I don't know what that. Is. I want us to both. I'm going to do this gradually, step by step. I want us all to be very comfortable with the basics, and then how networks work. And then we'll build on that as you and I enjoy this together, and we continue. So. Let's talk about when I was young. I was born in 1964. It's a long time ago. But when I was young, I was in a, anyway, for whatever reason, I learned Morse code. Morse code. And Morse code is a combination of dots and dashes. So a dot would be represented by tapping like once, and a dash would be a longer period of time. So I learned SOS. Dot, 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 dash, 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 dot, dot, dot. It would sound something like this. There we go, SOS. And that might come in really handy sometime if that's, you know, if we could communicate with that. Now, SOS is only effective for me to do it or us to do it if we're sending a message and there's somebody else who hears that message and who, what's the word I'm looking for, understands it. So if you and I are the only two people on the planet that understand SOS and the, the set of rules regarding how it works, it's not gonna be too effective unless you and I are talking to each other. We can't talk to the outside world. But fortunately, there's a you know a lot of people, at least in the past, who learn in the military who learn SOS or learn Morse code. And so the benefit is we have a set of rules of how Morse code works, like SOS. So we're using the correct rules of saying SOS in Morse code, and then somebody else who understands that same set of rules could interpret that and say, oh, that means SOS. Great. So what does that got to do with networks? SO Morse code is an example of a protocol. A protocol is a fancy word, P-R-O-T-O-C-O-L. It's a fancy word that means rules, a set of rules or agreements. So somebody somewhere developed Morse code. They agreed to it as a protocol that they could use with other people who also understood that set of rules, that protocol, and then they can talk back and forth. Now here's the great thing with networks. There are protocols, which is a fancy way of saying a set of rules, lots of sets of different rules, that if they're followed by one device, another device on the network can interpret what that means, and that's how we can move data back and forth, by following the same set of protocols. So that's our another objective for today, was to understand what exactly is a protocol. And a protocol is a set of rules that two parties on the network agree with, and the network can then allow those devices to communicate, because it's just like Morse code, they understand how the other is communicating because of the rules, the protocols, and then they can communicate with each other by following those same sets of rules. 
So as I look at my notes here, our objectives were to identify, you know, what exactly is a client or server. A server is a device that's providing a network service, like a web server. We're going up to Google's web server or DNS server or something else, and we're getting responses back. We're acting as a client. It's acting as a server, and we're having network communication. The reason that works is because we have protocols that our browser is using in the background. So we open up our browser, we go to www.myfavoritewebsite.com, we press enter and boom, magic happens. But you and I, what we get to do is realize that it's not, of course, magic. That's a set of lots of sets of rules or protocols behind the scenes that are agreed to and being used. And that's why it's working. And so as we progress through these CCNA Sundays together, we're going to take a look at the individual, like we're going to specialize in individual areas of the network overall functionality, how it works. And some of those areas are going to involve the layers. In fact, let me, let me clean this up to an appropriate level so that it makes sense. Let me get out my, one of my favorite tools. And one of my favorite tools with annotation here is the eraser tool. <laughs> so, you mean, Keith, we don't have to memorize the OSI reference model? And I'm saying correct, because that was a long time ago. I'm going to show you with you here in a moment something that is important to remember, but it's not the OSI, literally. So we don't need to memorize the OSI reference model. And so at the same time, the OSI reference model was being, you know, touted as a framework or an idea of how to, you know, consider the individual compartments or components of a network functionality. The TCPIP protocol stack was being developed by um, the U.S. government, Department of Defense, and it became the actual main thing that's being used. So today, we actually use this protocol stack, and when we say a protocol stack, let's break that down. Protocol is simply an agreement, right? A set of rules that we're agreeing to, and a protocol, a set of agreements that all kind of work together. We could call that a stack of, of agreements that all work together or we could call it a protocol stack. So when somebody says a protocol stack, it's basically saying a set of different rules that are all designed to interoperate and work with and cooperate with each other. So we can demystify that, not have to worry about it anytime we hear the word protocol or just, in fact, anywhere. Coding, programming, networking. The word protocol simply means a predefined set of rules that hopefully at least two devices or more agree to and then they can follow those rules, those protocols for success. So whether we're writing software applications or we're automating a network or we're changing the configuration of a Cisco router or switch, we're simply configuring and working with the protocols to make them cooperate and work with each other. All right, back to the whiteboard here. So we use the TCP IP protocol stack. However, um, we, we thought, you know what? It's kind of cool that the OSI reference model chopped up the individual functionality into layers. So what they did was, and I'm going to get, erase this too, because this one here is no longer, I mean, unless you're just, somebody asks you a trivia question, <laughs> which we're not about that here. We're about how do networks work? How do we get good at working with them? And that value that we bring, because we understand how the network works and then eventually how to configure them and troubleshoot them, that, that makes us more valuable. It makes us more valuable to ourselves and our families and our employers. And it makes work fun because there's a problem or something comes up and you think, oh yeah, I, I, in fact, when I use troubleshooting all the time with computer networks and that's because things don't always go right. But when something does go wrong, like there's a gamer in my, <laughs> in my, within a hundred feet and that gamer's like, ah, I just know that either that gamer lost something or there is a network issue and I can dive right in and say, okay, great. Let me check the Wi-Fi. Let me check the ethernet. Let me check the speeds here. Let me check this, 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 this. And I can identify it if it's a local problem. And uh, if it's not a local problem, then it's outside our control sometimes, but it's good. It's good. And also like, like VR, <clears throat> I enjoy virtual reality. Um, <laughs> it is so amazing. So you put, I have a Quest headset. Uh, it's the end of 2019, um, probably in, a year or two, there'll be something amazing, even better. Anyway, it's fantastic. But if I if I analyze that network traffic and what's really happening, is it still using this protocol stack and this set of rules? And the answer is yes. Yes, it is. And so this information is gonna benefit you whether you're supporting a network in the corporate environment or at home or at a friend's house or, or wherever. It's really great to have an idea of how these layers all work together, which we'll, we'll do in separate and uh, subsequent videos. So going back to our drawing here, um, 
we have these one, two, three, four, these five categories of functionality. And I'm not going to ask you to memorize these yet. Um, because what I would like to do is point out that in the world of networking, we have these layers. And let me actually change that color. This would be great. Uh, let me bring this up. And let me use the, uh, there we go. I'm going to color code them so it's very easy to see. So we have, um, like, at the application layer, there are sets of protocols or rules and programs and applications and services that can run to provide network services. So let's imagine that we have a user like Bob. <laughs> and, and now that's and now that's our inside joke, by the way. So we've got it. And then I have, oh, my dad's amazing. He's 90. He can do VR standing. His balance is amazing. And I also compete with him on uh, for exercise, like number of minutes standing and so forth. He never loses. He never, never loses. Amazing. Okay. So if Bob is sitting here at his computer and Bob opens up his favorite browser, and this is just an example of how a protocol stack, a set of protocols might interoperate and work together. And we're going to cover individual detail on each of these layers in subsequent live streams. So Bob's in his browser. You can imagine whatever you'd like that to be. It might be Safari. It might be Chrome. It might be Edge. It might be Firefox. Whatever browser you know Bob chose to use. Now, behind the scenes, if Bob goes to uh, www.favesite, I'm just making that up, .com, so he goes to favesite.com, and then behind the scenes, that's going to be translated into a an IP address, which we'll talk more about as well. So behind the scenes, humans like to use names like favesite.com or twitch.com or youtube.com. But behind the scenes, behind every single name, there is an IP address. IP is an acronym for Internet Protocol Address, sort of like a street and house name or number. Like if you get mail at your house, these, the, the envelope is addressed to you at your house address on a common street that you have with your neighbors. And so that's what IP addresses are about. We'll take a closer look at that as well. Okay, so behind the scenes though, when Bob makes that request, what, he's, what his computer is actually doing is using an application layer service called Web Services. And they have a fancy name for that. And that name is HTTP, Hypertext Transfer Protocol, or HTTPS. And these are just examples. We'll, we'll take separate looks at each of these layers. and then. With that application layer service from a server that's going to be providing the web service that Bob is requesting, before Bob spits that packet or that information out on the network, so let's say Bob is connected to a switch. A switch is a, a network device that can forward traffic in the right direction. And we might also have a router. A router is also another network device that can forward traffic in the right direction. So let's imagine Bob is up here and Bob wants to go to the server at favesite.com. Well, behind the scenes, before his computer starts spitting out that information into the network, his computer is going to take that request, uh, the application layer, and it's going to do something called encapsulation. I mean, it's going to add. It's going to add some information based on layer four. And there's a couple of main protocols here at layer four, uh, and we'll have separate videos on all those. Uh, one of those is TCP. It stands for the Transmission Control Protocol. And if you and I were going to send a very important letter to somebody and we wanted to make sure it got there, we might ask for a receipt, you know, a like guaranteed delivery with a receipt. And that's what the transmission control protocol does at the transport layer here in this TCP IP protocol stack. It's reliable. It, it basically makes sure that it's okay to talk to that person on the other end of the server. It also gets little receipts occasionally to confirm, oh, yep, you got it. Great. Here's more and so forth. So basically, before Bob sends his data on the network, not only is he requesting a web service, but he's also going to be using another protocol, another set of rules, that's going to verify that the, the information got there and the response came back and everything else behind the scenes. So Bob is just blissfully <laughs> going, but behind the scenes, we're going to use other protocols at the various layers. So as that traffic continues to work its way in the brain of Bob's computer and browser, it's also going to include information about the addresses involved, the IP addresses. And so it's going to add Bob's source IP address, sort of like sending a letter. If we, if, if you and I were going to send letters back and forth to each other through the mail, um, I would put on your IP address as the destination. And if you were sending it in a message to me, you'd be sending it to my IP address or my house number and street name. So basically, IP addressing is a lot like street names and house numbers and it has to be added or included 
before Bob spits it out on the network because network devices need information to go ahead and forward it. And then as Bob's computer continues to think about this request that it's sending out, it's also going to go ahead and include something called a layer two address or a MAC address. And we're gonna save all those details for the very next stream, which is gonna happen on, let me look at my, uh, Sunday the 11th, 8th, wait a sec, 8th, it's not, no, sorry. Uh, <laughs> I'll look at the date for next Sunday, but it'll be at 11 a.m. next Sunday. It will be our next stream, and we'll we'll start it at layer two. So Bob includes all that information, and then Bob spits that information onto the network, and then the network devices forward it in the direction of the server, who then opens it up, sees the request, and then responds back to Bob. So the actual details about these protocols, these rules that happen at each of these respective layers, we're going to save that for future discussions. And the, and the cool part is this. We don't have to master it all at once. We can say, okay, great. Let's focus on like, you know, what happens at layer two and why is it important? What goes on there? And we'll do a similar treatment for layer three. What happens there and layer four and the application layer. So there's three basic things that I wanted us to take away from this chat, this discussion. First was clients and servers. A client is making some kind of a network request, whether it's for a file server or a web server or a Twitch server or some other or a stream or something else. It's making the request and the server is providing the response based on the request from the client. The second thing I would wanted to do is chat with you about the benefit of layers. The benefit of layers is that we don't have to just understand everything all at once. We can say, you know what? I understand there's some basic layers, <laughs> basic separate compartments or departments inside of network operations. And now that I understand that the protocols are simply rules that all kind of work together, in our next and subsequent stream, we can focus on how each of those protocols and what those protocols are, protocols like HTTP and protocols like TCP and IP and so forth, because those are all protocols, sets of rules that we're using to communicate over a network. And the third thing I want to do is uh, I want to do um, the benefits of layers and then also demystify protocol stack. So a protocol stack is a grouping of rules or protocols that can work together and interoperate together. And as we continue these CCNA Sundays, we're gonna next tackle layer two and take a look at what happens there with examples. Also, you know what? We can also use protocol analyzers too. Um, it's, it's one thing to understand the concept of, okay, there's layers and here's what happens at that layer, but it's another thing to actually see it. And you might say, well, Keith, how do we, how do we see you know, <laughs> the the computer's doing all this work and all this all these protocol stack elements working together. It spits out the network information on the network. How do we see it? And the answer is we scoop up that information off the network and then we have a program called a protocol analyzer or a packet capture software that can show us the details. So that way it becomes more than just theory. We can actually see, oh, here's the this layer stuff and here's this layer stuff. like application layer and transport layer and IP layer and network layer. And we can actually see it to reinforce the concepts. So we'll take those step by step as they come. Um, and those were our three objectives that I wanted to address and cover in this live stream as a warm up to CCNN. And these concepts, by the way, they apply to everything IP. So whether you're pursuing a CCNA or Network Plus or just want to know more about how the network works, as we dive in, we'll be taking a look at each of the layers. Also, what you and I can do to troubleshoot and verify that those layers are working correctly if something goes bump. <laughs> I guess that wasn't a bump. Bump in the night and stops working. So let me go ahead and bring up our objectives one more time just to confirm. And here they are. Yeah, there they are. And let me get rid of that one layer right there. Okay, so what are the roles of clients and servers? What are the benefits of layers? And what is a protocol stack? So I guess as a test of how did we do collectively, one of the things I would do is maybe um, contact a friend, a loved one, a spouse, partner, uh, anyone that'll chat with you for a moment. And I, and I encourage you to take the challenge of explaining these things to a person who is a non-IT person. Um, what are the roles or the, you know, of a client or server? What makes a device a client or what makes a device a server? What's the benefit of layers? And what is a protocol stack? And I put it in quotes because um, 
really a protocol is something, simply a set of rules. And a stack of rules is simply a bunch of rules that cooperate and interact with each other. So the benefit of chatting with somebody else and walking them through this is that it can help identify uh, areas that like, oh, how's that work again? Or, um, you know, I don't really understand that as well as I need to at this high level. Let me go ahead and watch this video again or this live stream. Also, what I'd be happy to have you do and what I'd love you to do is in the comments section, you know, for this presentation, because I'm talking with you like 100%, I haven't had a chance to look at the comments yet. So I'll get to those in just a moment. But if you see a comment, whether it's uh, this live stream happening live or it's posted and somebody has a comment and you know the answer to it, if somebody has a question, my encouragement is to jump in and answer it. Help them, help your neighbor, your brother, your sister, your fellow human as they start to internalize this and better understand it. This is it's a fantastic journey in the world of networking. I love it. I absolutely love it. So what I'm gonna do is this. I'm gonna put uh, some music on for a few moments and I'm gonna take a look at the queue real quick to see if there's any questions that are burning that I need to answer immediately for us here in the live stream. And then I'll come back with one follow-up insight as to a couple things that I'm creating that I think you'll love as well. So give me just a moment. I'll put some music on and I'll be right back. All right, and I want to I want to thank uh, wow. There's several people who have responded, but I want to thank Mike. Um, way to go, <laughs> Mike is in there yeah, answering questions, and uh, I appreciate that. That is fantastic. And I I'm looking at the responses. He, Mike, you're spot on. Uh, for anybody who's pursuing CCNP and they're like part way through it before 2020, uh, February of 2020, there is a tool called the Cisco Migration Tool. Mm, is it called Cisco Migration or Cisco Certification Tool? Let me look it up real quick. And uh, actually, I'll add it to a comment uh, in this. Once this gets posted as a recording, I'll go ahead and add that URL so you can find it. And it shows you exactly what you, what you have taken so far based on the checkboxes and then what you'll get after February 24th, 2020 as a result. All right. So, Mike, thank you very much. I appreciate uh, you jumping in and supporting our, you know, other people who are studying and learning. Fantastic. Okay, so next week, uh, the 15th, is what I'm seeing as the calendar item for that. Let me verify that. Yeah, 15th is next Sunday. So what we're going to do is we're going to cover level two or layer two. We'll do a quick overview of the protocol stack and how the pieces can work together. And we're going to focus on layer two. And you might say, well, Keith, what's a layer two? Well, it's not. Um, in the, on the serious note, layer two is freaking amazing. Layer two deals with switches, layer two switches that forward frames based on the destination layer two addresses. And it also deals with things like VLANs, virtual local area networks, which I don't know why, but the word VLANs is just amazing to me. I like it. It's like VLANs. It's, it's pretty cool too. Also, um, the concept of trunking is in there. So I may break those out into separate sections, but I want to do a really good uh, discussion about layer two so that you understand completely that when Bob sends a frame into the switch, that those bits, how the frames make forwarding decisions. And here's a little spoiler alert. They, they use the layer, a layer two switch uses the layer two address for forwarding. And then we'll follow that up in a subsequent live stream about layer three routing and IP addressing and the transport layer and the application layer. So by the time we're done, if you hang out with me every week for a few minutes, um, you'll be very comfortable with how the protocol stack works how the pieces and parts fit together, and and 
will then take that and we'll start applying it into a Cisco centric network interface or architecture, which also would apply to Juniper uh, and HP and Palo Alto and Citrix and uh, other vendors as well. So the concepts we're going to learn about IP networking, they apply. Also, we'll take a look at IPv6 also as we take a look at layer three. All right, so I'll see you right next Sunday, same bat time, same bat channel. Also, if you're interested, I'm also doing on Wednesdays at 4 p.m. and I'll put out an announcement as well. I'm doing a, a behind, the scene, behind the scenes sneak peek at some of the content that I'm creating at CBT Nuggets regarding the CCNA and the DevNet programs. Um, stuff I like to share when I can, stuff that hasn't been released yet so that you get a, like an inside view, behind the scenes look at what that is and what's going on. So I wanted to keep this close to 30 minutes. I think we're uh, I did pretty good. Again, thanks for the support on the back end by having, as, as a community, helping each other with the questions and confirming. I love it. So have a great, great rest of your day. Thanks for joining me for this live stream on CCNA. And um, the link is going to be uh, ogit.online slash CCNA01. Any guesses on what the next one? Any guesses on what the next one's going to be? Yeah, zero two. That way it'll be very easy to find as well. And that way when they're all done, you can have a whole stream or a whole you know series of in order of content regarding Cisco's Certified Network Associate and more importantly, the technology and the skills to be able to understand it, configure it, and hopefully with enough knowledge and practice, troubleshoot it as well. All right. Thanks, everybody. I'll see you in the next live stream.